Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Hunter O'Haney, and I'm the director of the Stonewall National Museum and Archives here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and I'm very happy to have all of you here. And I am here with Jenny Olson. Jenny, say hello. Hello. <laughs> it's, it's nice to see you. Where are we finding you this evening? Uh, I am in Berkeley, California, in my living room. Well, hello. Um, and how long have you been in California? Uh, since 1991, I came from uh, Minnesota to San Francisco to be a co-director of Frameline, the San Francisco International LGBT Film Festival. And we were just talking, you're from Minnesota originally. Um, how much do you enjoy being in California compared to Minnesota? Uh, I cannot imagine ever going back to Minnesota. I, I, when I do go back to visit, I go, how does anyone survive this landscape? Mm. Although, of course, these days, California is not easy either. Um, right. yeah. Yes, and the fires and some of the causes of the fires, all that stuff has been just really interesting for us to read about here uh, on the East Coast about what's been going on in California. So it's it's been quite, it's been, quite a slog that we've been going through. But just to remind everybody, um, uh, we're here in uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, uh, Stonewall National Museum and Archives. Uh, we've been around for about 47 years. We have the largest LGBT, LGBTQ library in the United States, uh, 28,000 volumes. And in our archives, we have over 2,700 linear feet of material in the archives which I'm told translates into about 6 million pieces of paper. Um, and it's, it's impressive. It's mostly from the last quarter of the 20th century to the present day. And Jenny, I know that you are an archivist at heart. And so whenever you want to come and take a look at what we have in the archives, I hope you come and, and see what we have. I will take you up on that someday. Yeah. Yeah. Well, someday when travel happens, I will say um, I don't want to set your expectations up, up too high, uh, but our film holdings in the archives are quite um, uh, sparse um, and not, not uh, very surprising. A lot of the film that we have is either Super 8 or 8 millimeter film um, and not home done stuff, but commercially done gay male porn film, which many gay archives have a lot of that work out there. Yeah, back in the days before uh, VHS, when you had to have a little film print and your own projector to watch your gay porn. Right, right. And of course, times have changed. And, and of course, that stuff is important. But so many film archivists uh, come or, or they'll contact us and they'll say, do you have a film of this talk or that talk or this demonstration or that? And while we have uh, so many riches in the archives, I have to say I've not yet found in our film collection uh, that there's more beyond sort of the run of the mill uh, gay male porn that you would expect to find in an archive like this. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of LGBT um, archives don't have a, a lot of actual film and, you know, and which in some ways is makes sense and is in a lot of ways is better to have film at actual film archives, just in terms of the taking care of the materials is such a, you know, unique thing in terms of the storage requirements and um, which is a great, uh, you know, jumping off point to <laughs> that, that all of my, um, uh, collection just went to the Harvard Film Archive, which is really great that it's a film archive. Um, of course, it, I mean, it, and it's an amazing place for all that to, to be. So just to put a, a few ground rules here, we'll, we'll be here. Uh, we started this series of online talks. We do one week. Uh, we started at the beginning of the pandemic and it's been great that we've had so many people join us from around the country. And so if this is your first time coming to a Stonewall event, uh, welcome. As I said, we are uh, here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 
the organization has been around for 47 years, largest LGBTQ library in the world, as well as one of the, I would say we're, the, we're in the top five from a number standpoint in the United States. Uh, we are open now uh, five days a week from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, and so if you're in the South Florida area and you wanna come by and see stuff, please feel free to come by and see us. Also, I would suggest that you visit our website at stonewall-museum.org. There's just a whole bunch of stuff you can find out there and you can email any of us uh, there as well to ask us a question or figure out how you can come and make a visit to see us there. So there's a tremendous amount of good stuff there on the website. Um, and also, if you don't get our newsletter, uh, you can sign up for the newsletter, although I suspect we're going to be signing you up for the newsletter anyway. Um, so you should start seeing that every Tuesday as well. It's very easy to unsubscribe and we don't ask for money too much. So it's um, like any nonprofit, we have to survive. And so, and so that's very important. I wanna do a shout out to our deputy director, Emery Grant. Emery, reveal yourself if you will. There you are. Hello, Emery. Nice to see you. Hello, uh, Jenny. And, it's an honor to have you here tonight. Thank you. And so uh, Emery has um, has been a big fan of Jenny's over the, the years. And so uh, it's great to be able to have Jenny here. So the way these talks work, these are all re recorded. So if you have friends who are not able to make it tonight, just let them know that they can see the recording. The recording will be on our website but also we're recording this live on Facebook. Um, and so we find many people join us there as well. Uh, and of course you can see that um, at any time in the future as well too. Uh, you can do it through um, our website or, or just by finding us, us there. So I kind of think that's a bit of our um, uh, business we need to get out of the, the way. So uh, this talk came about because um, actually, a friend of mine, Joe Zena, uh, who was the former head of the Coolidge Corner Theater in Brookline, Massachusetts, uh, sent me this link from uh, WBUR to say, gee, Harvard has started doing um, an LGBTQ archive, or film archive. And uh, I took a look at that, and then I quickly, and I've been listening to WBOR for a long time, and so I saw that there as well. And so I reached out to Jenny and I said, would you like to j join us, um, particularly around the occasion of having the archive being placed at Harvard. I thought that was kind of an important thing uh, for us to, to be able to go through. So I reached out to Jenny, and little did I know at the time, we have, um, at least one mutual friend, if not more. And so it was nice to, to be able to discover that. And uh, Jenny was very generous to say that they would like to join us and, and to have this conversation. Um, and also just as another ground rule, we will, if you have questions, uh, please feel free to th throw your questions into either the chat or the Q&A portion. We'll get to them at the last 15 minutes of the talk. Um, if something seems burning, if you want, even if you just want to say hi, uh, we we put those up as well too. So um, put put those comments there as well too, um, and we'll try to get to those at at the end. And we usually do get to everybody's questions and comments there. So um, feel free to throw throw them out there. So. Um, just to give everybody a sense uh, of Jenny's background, Jenny is one of the lead, uh, the world's leading experts on LGBTQ film history and has been a longtime champion of LGBTQ cinema around the world. Uh, the collection um, consists of materials relating to Jenny's own filmmaking, including prints, negatives, and digital masters, and the production distribution and distribution documentation. Um, and um, she has two feature length essay films, The Joy of Life in 2005, as well as The Royal Road in 2015, uh, which premiered at the Sundance Film Festival. And like many of her short films has screened internationally to awards and much acclaim. Jenny's work as a film historian includes the Lambda Award nominated uh, the Queer Movie Poster Book 
uh, and her many vintage uh, movie trailer presentations. Her film criticism has appeared in numerous publications, including Filmmaker Magazine, The Advocate, and San Francisco Bay Guardian. And she's currently a film columnist for Logo TV's uh, New Now Next. Um, there's plenty of stuff that you can read about her background. She really is amazingly accomplished, and you can see all of that um, on our website as well. So, um, Jenny, uh, welcome officially. It's nice to see you here as part of the Stonewall family. Yes. Thank you for having me. I, I'll just say just a shout out for my website, which is uh, butch.org. And I'm pretty proud of being the proprietor of butch.org. Great. Good. So let's, let's, my first question is really uh, about you. Um, so are you a filmmaker? Are you a historian? Are you an archivist? Are you a writer? Um, what are you? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Actually, I think that's, I think that's what it says on my website in exactly that order. Um, I, my background, uh, well, I also have multiple backgrounds, but I guess my initial background is as a curator. Um, in 1986, I started the, uh, a thing called Lavender Images, which was a gay and lesbian film series at the University of Minnesota. Um, and that in, kind of evolved into the Minneapolis St. Paul uh, LGBT Film Festival, which I ran for many years. Um, and so that was kind of my original background. I, and then I, at the same time, became a film critic um, writing for the local gay paper in uh, Minneapolis. Um, and so, you know, these things kind of all evolved. Uh, and I didn't actually start making films until the early 90s, um, which also kind of arose out of being a curator and seeing so many um, films and, and thinking, oh, I guess I could try to do that. Um, so, so if you don't mind me asking, how old were you in the early 90s when you decided to make that decision that having, having had a certain amount of accomplishment under your belt, that you were actually going to, to, to move from being an observer and analyst to being a maker? I don't think it was that conscious uh, of a decision so much. I mean, I, I have always kind of worn a lot of hats and continue to kind of go, you know, yeah, oh, I'm a little, am I a filmmaker, am I a historian? Um, and uh, I, I mean, I made short films for kind of the, throughout the 90s, and it wasn't really until I made my first feature in 2005 um, that I started being able to really think like, oh, actually I am a filmmaker, and like to say <laughs> I am a filmmaker. Um, and uh, anyway, so, and you know, even now, I mean, I am a filmmaker, but it's a very, it's not like it's a uh, lucrative career per se. Uh, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's hard to, well, yeah, I, I certainly don't make a living at it. No, it's it's hard to, to do, and of course, so many art forms are very are very hard to actually make uh, a viable career and a money making career. Right? Um, so, for you, why filmmaking? Why did film and time based medium really uh, resonate with, with you? How did you en end up there? Well, I mean, I think um, so. Just to back up in terms of the beginning of my career. So I read a book called The Celluloid Closet uh, by Vito Russo, uh, which looks at the history of homosexuality on screen. And um, that really was how, how I came out. Um, I, in retrospect, it's kind of amazing to me that I was not able to kind of get my shit together until uh, my early 20s. And um, Anyway, and so I, I read The Cellular Closet and that was this kind of light bulb moment of um, obviously I'm queer and I wanna connect with these films, I wanna see these films. 
and I'm going to start a gay film series on campus because I'll bet other people want to see these films. And so, you know, it was the beginning of a career, you know, of all of the aspects of my career that um, just the importance of, and the, the power of film to, you know, seeing ourselves on screen um, can be, you know, life-saving. Uh, and so I just followed my heart in that path. And um, so I had said earlier, I, in 1991, I, I applied for the festival co-director job here in San Francisco. And, you know, it was like the best job in the world in my little tiny profession and got it and moved to San Francisco and, you know, became co-director of the festival here. And, you know, things just kind of kept evolving. Um, and now I'm like, what was your original question? Um, <laughs> oh, well, there, but there, that's good. But let me, so let, let me interrupt you, you there. Do you at times think about film again, as your own career as a filmmaker, this is apart from managing a lot of the work that you do, but as a filmmaker do you, and as a creator, do you feel that filmmaking is limited? Do you wish that you had the expansive time to write a novel of 400 pages or that you had the ability to, to put drawings or, or to put color on a canvas? Um, is it, how does it set with you? Um, well, it's interesting you bring up books because I, I recently, well, in the last two years, I have been writing a book, not a novel, but a, an essayistic uh, memoir um, that I started uh, in the summer of 2018. I got to be a, a McDowell fellow. And, um, and I finally actually just recently finished my, my first of many final final drafts um, and sent it off to a prospective agent. Um, and it's very, well, satisfying to be able to say so much more. I mean, it's, it's I don't know, 350 pages, I think. Um, and, uh, uh, and it doesn't cost money. And I think that's the hardest thing about filmmaking is that it's expensive and um, you know, doesn't necessarily bring back a lot of money. And so I've always kind of had simultaneously had like a job job and then, you know, been kind of moonlighting as a filmmaker or, you know, fitting things in or for 10 years, I worked for Wolf Video, which is the largest LGBT uh, DVD streaming distributor. And um, I worked that job four days a week and I had one day a week to do my filmmaking. Um, so, and, but, but, so to answer the original question in terms of the form, um, so I make um, 16 millimeter urban landscape essay films and, you know, so, which is also a very, uh, you know, non-commercial uh, realm to be in. Um, but as a form, there is just nothing like it. And it, it, it feels like it is the, the medium that I am drawn to and that I can say what I want to say and reach an audience in a certain way that's for me about um, a kind of contemplative experience. Um, and I'm I'm very interested in the analog versus the digital. So I shoot on 16 millimeter film. Um, and I'm also very interested in telling stories from a butch perspective. And, you know, in terms of the kind of, you know, whatever substance or content of my films. Um, I mean, they're also very digressive and they're about all kinds of other things, but, uh, but it's a unique form that that is for better or worse <laughs> has been mostly the way that I want to, um, you know, communicate with the world as an artist. Um, but, but I, it has, it has been exciting to, to write, um, you know, just on the page. Yes. And of course, as you say, as a filmmaker, it, it takes money and it takes a team in many ways. It's like theater in the sense that 
playwrights or even composers can have ideas of what they want to see realized, but it's very difficult for them to be able to do it without having a group of talented people around them to make it happen. And for you as a filmmaker, not only do you have to have the idea and you have to be able to have the production capabilities of thinking about things and you, you need to be a writer as well too, but you need to be, and then you need a great big pot of money but you, but, but, but you, you need to assemble that team in order to make it happen. Yeah, as that goes, I do feel fortunate that my production, uh, I, I mean, I, I decided at the very beginning that I was not gonna make conventional narrative films, um, partly because I thought I would make very bad conventional narrative films, um, but you know, so I don't have any, there are no actors, there are no sets, there are no, uh, there's no lighting, there's no, there's not even like um, sound recorded while I'm shooting, it's all done in post-production um, and, uh, or whatever, put together in post-production. Um, but so it's just me and my cinematographer, me and my sound recordist, me and my editor, uh, you know, one person at a time with me <laughs> and, um, it's uh, so it's pretty minimalist in terms of production. Um, I, I, it's incredible to me that people make, you know, movies with multiple people and actors and all of these things that you don't have control over. Um, but uh, but yes, it does require uh, large pots of money that are hard to come by. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's absolutely true, and it it, it does happen. So. So let's just move along a little bit here and let's sort of talk generally. I know this is a, a very broad topic, but let's talk a little bit about LGBTQ film. And um, I, I know there's like such a big range of that topic about films that actually deal with or are made by with a queer perspective of LGBTQ individuals. But if there's any way you could try to characterize that for me, what is the sort of the state of LGBTQ films? Uh, what's happening today? Um, tell us a little bit about gay films today in the world. Um, well, I mean, you know, it's a very, it's an interesting time. It's a very challenging time, um, particularly in terms of the kind of queer film um, ecosystem. I always think of it as an ecosystem, you know, that obviously you have filmmakers and then you have, you know, how does the filmmaker ultimately connect with, you know, with an audience? And to me, I, um, you know, LGBT film festivals uh, are, of, to me, of the, you know, paramount importance in terms of to me, it, as an experience, I mean, as a physical experience, film festivals, you know, bring us together. We get to engage with films on screen and kind of experience ourselves in community and have conversations and understand, you know, understand ourselves. Um, and I mean, I always think of, you know, so there's kind of that piece of the, the kind of festival community connected to the community community and then there's like the mainstream and obviously it's exciting to see you know big movies like I don't know Rocket Man or <laughs> you know or like I'm trying to think of some other big you know big gay movies or big gay you know shows or whatever um, and that's exciting in its own way um, but I always, I always reflect back. V Vito Rousseau had this saying. I think it's, it's like might even be the last line of the cellular closet where he said something like, "Don't expect anything from Hollywood," um, which I take to mean, you know, don't, you know, it's just limited what we're gonna be able to get from the mainstream because it's there's a sense of you know the larger audience and the kind of commercial concerns and um you know where we're my my opinion is that where we are going to see 
films that, you know, speak directly to us in all of our diverse identities and uh, uh, our kind of deeper concerns um, is going to be, you know, films that typically you would see at, at film festivals and that, um, you know, are less about uh, prioritizing commercial concerns. Um, and so it is a really uh, scary time that, you know, festivals like, um, I mean, uh, Frameline and Outfest and Newfest being the largest and, and Inside Out in Toronto um, are really struggling because uh, they're, you know, they weren't able to do their physical festivals and are trying to, you know, sustain online versions of the festivals. And um, anyway, it's a, it's a precarious time. Um, and it'll because, be because, because many of those festivals, of course, were precarious even before they were hit with a pandemic. Um, many of them are have been motivated by mission and passion, and and some of them I don't know exactly, but some of them certainly have been nonprofit organizations as well too, which have a whole other set of challenges. So if you add the lack of commercial viability and then put the pandemic and then. Uh, what some would consider to be a hostile governmental situation. Uh, I can imagine it's very hard for some of these organizations. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's, it, you know, it's not like there was a hugely sustainable model there uh, or whatever. I mean, the, you know, they're just dependent on so many sources of funding and, um, and I think anyway, you know, they're such invaluable, uh, resources for us. Um, do you ever get mad or do you get, uh, mad might be too strong of a word, but do you get disappointed or do you get frustrated when you see some of the commercial producers and commercial publications moving forward with um, particular LGBTQ projects that are not that well thought out or that are not that probing or, 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 or that are just um, there to make a buck um, and sort of give lip service to the t topic as opposed to deal with real issues? Does that frustrate you? Uh, I don't know. I think, you know, there just are all, it's great that things are getting made. And like, I mean, as you were saying that, I found myself thinking of, I just saw the trailer for the new, um, the Ryan Murphy uh, remake of The Boys in the Band. Yeah. Um, that's yeah. To Netflix and um, you know the all-star cast and stuff and uh, and like on the one hand it's exciting it's like oh this big huge gay thing and on the other hand I don't know looking at the trailer it was like it doesn't look very good <laughs> and like you know but it's sort of like okay I guess you know equal opportunity we get to have crappy movies too and um, you know I don't know and maybe it's better than what the trailer looks like but I think the original film itself, uh, you know, is challenging uh, to, I mean, it has its own kind of problems and, you know, reflects the time that it was made, but, uh, but it made me feel like, I think I'd rather watch the original than the remake. Um, yeah. I mean, in many ways it's, uh, that, that's true in the sense that sometimes the remake is far better than, than, uh, I'm sorry, in many ways, the original is far better than, than what the remake is. And al although I, I will say I'm one of those people that actually saw the original Boys in the Band on Broadway and then also saw the, uh, the most recent one that came out last year on Broadway with the same cast that's going to be in the film. And um, uh, my two cents is that they were both very loyal to the script um, and they were both professionally done, and um, I I enjoyed them both. Um, well, we'll see. <laughs> Wait, I have to. I just I brought some props with me, so Good. I just have to show you. So, this is Emery, which yeah. is Poodle, and this is this is the famous that scene. Okay. Um, just these are some of the things that are going to be going off to Harvard to the uh, to the Harvard Film Archive. It's not only my uh, 
film, actual film prints, but my uh, collection of memorabilia and posters and such. Just so to, let's, talk, let's talk a little bit about the archive at Harvard. Um, tell us a little bit about it and how it came about. Um, I've been working in the last couple of years with various um, other archives and other collections. I, one of my side projects has been a thing called the uh, working on the, the films of Arthur J. Bresson Jr., who's a pioneering gay filmmaker, mainly of the 70s and 80s. Um, and I started a thing with Arthur's sister, Roe Bresson, called the Bresson Project to uh, restore and re-release his, uh, all of his films. And, and in trying to place his papers, I kind of immersed myself in this whole world of uh, academic archives. And um, his papers went to the uh, Cornell uh, Human Sexuality Collection which was very exciting. And um, anyway, in that process, I kind of thought more about it and I thought um, I should find a home for my materials. And uh, through various connections, uh, got connected to the folks at the Harvard Film Archive. And um, they, um, they're very well resourced, so they will take good care of my stuff, which is a huge relief. Um, they have a specialty in experimental and LGBT work. So like they have the films of uh, Warren Sonbert, who's a gay experimental filmmaker who was also from the Bay Area. Um, they have uh, George Kuchar's work. Um, they, anyway, and, and, um, and then they also have a, they do exhibition, which they will do when they open up again. <laughs> And they want to do um, like show things, which, you know, mainly my stuff is, you know, in cans and just sitting there and they want to actually uh, be able to show things and, that, and so have me work with them to curate programs. And I have everything from, um, you know, 35 millimeter feature films 16 millimeter feature films, um, stuff like, um, I'm trying to think of some good examples. I, like I collected, have collect, I've been collecting since the mid eighties, um, mainly uh, films that don't have regular distribution. Like I don't have, you know, a copy of Philadelphia for, per se, you know, but I have, so I, I have a 16 millimeter print of um, that certain summer which was like the made for TV movie in the seventies. That was like the first gay made for TV movie. Or I have one of my favorite things, actually, since you guys are in Florida, you'll appreciate this. I have a 16 millimeter print of the uh, Anita Bryant in 1977, getting the pie in her face from the activist at a press conference. Um, I have like, ephemeral educational shorts, um, all kinds of just very random things. Um, and, um, and then a lot of trailers. I also sp have specialized in collecting 35 millimeter trailers. And um, anyway, and so I'm gonna do some programming with all of that and, and have them show things and um, yeah. That's that's great, and and just when we're talking about Arthur J. Bresson, um, his sister's on here, and his sister uh, Rose says uh, the Bresson Project owes its existence to you, Jenny. Uh, they'll she'll be forever grateful to you for re -help, for helping to reintroduce and introduce um, his uh, films to audiences across the world in the United States. So thank you for that. Uh, it's a wonderful sh shout out that you got from his sister there. Um, yeah, it, we do, we have, uh, you can go to the Bresson Project online on Facebook and Twitter, and we have all kinds of stuff going on, including we just re-released two of Arthur's first films, um, Passing Strangers from 1974 and Forbidden Letters from 1979, which are, they're both uh, gay adult films, but they're kind of like half narrative. Um, so they kind of bridge the, you know, 
the world of adult film and kind of early gay independent film. But you know, what's interesting about hearing you talk about, about the collection that has gone to Harvard um, is it's not only that you are a, a historian and an archivist, but you're also a collector. And so you had to, in some of these things, obviously you went back to, you've been collecting since the 1980s. They were thematically related to gay and LGBTQ material. It sounds like you were just interested in films that dealt with gay topics um, in the broadest sense of it. Um, what made you become a co collector? Um, I, it's interesting to think back. And I mean, when I started, uh, showing films, curating films, I, I had this impulse to own them. And that there's kind of like a fetishistic quality about it of like, just wanting, I, I should have brought an actual 35 millimeter trailer because it's more satisfying than this is just super eight. Um, you know, but the trailers are like, they're like big hockey pucks. And I, I felt like I, I don't know, I just wanted to own, you know, films and particularly queer films. And uh, uh, and trailers were the thing that I could afford. <laughs> like they were like you know five ten bucks a piece, um, and um, uh, sorry, I just blanked. What was the well, actual it's question? It's just how you became. Were, were there other collectors in your family of a generation above you that you saw? Uh, were there p people that you saw collecting things and wanted to have some degree of ownership of those objects that they were co collecting? Um, I, well, actually my stepfather collected, he collected um, eight by 10 uh, lobby cards, m production stills from films from the thirties. He was a, a usher in a movie theater in 1936. Wow. So I actually have like, I don't know, several hundred <laughs> production stills from 1936 of like classic Hollywood movies. So he probably was a, was a big influence in that. Um, and uh, uh, anyway, yeah. And this was, you know, pre long before eBay, um, there used to be a, a film collectors uh, monthly newspaper called the big reel and like these old, projectionists would like you know have these handwritten ads of like all these different films for sale and I would just go through and find anything that was gay or seemed gay um, and uh, and then the first thing that I did was the trailers and um, and then I, I put them together in feature length programs um, so I did this thing called homo promo that looks at kind of the trailers of early gay uh, uh, films and uh, anyway I got a little carried away with I was a bit of an addict actually <laughs> I had to I had to stop um, <laughs> I'm like I'm really glad that I stopped because eBay I think would just be uh, I, I would be completely broke well, yes, you know, we could, I, I mean, not all, all of us, but I certainly could join the collector's club out there. Uh, we can swap our, our collections from one to the other. It is this black hole that if you care about something like, like this, it can, uh, it can really um, take over your, your life and your bank account as well at the same time. So. Um, so speaking about the film that you made that were a number of trailers, the name of the, that, that again was Promo Homo. Uh, homo promo. Okay, I'm sorry, I got, got, it. I got homo, that back. Promo. Homo, and homo. It's can, actually, if, if they see it now, yeah, it's, um, in fact, if you go to butch.org, <laughs> yeah. uh, I have a section on my website with some of my uh, archival stuff. Um, homo promo is there. Uh, it's on, it's on, um, right now it's on canopy.com, the like canopy with a K. Um, you can watch it for free with your library card. Um, and uh, yeah, all, and all my films are on my website as well. I mean, they're all available through like iTunes and uh, Amazon Prime and Vimeo. Yes, and of course, uh, just as another shout out for uh, Jenny's web website, it is 
butch.org, uh, and I see Esther Newton has weighed in here, quote, love that your website is named butch.org, you go. <laughs> and so, uh, <laughs> yes. I'm very proud of that. I, I think I got it in like 1996. I had originally tried to get butch.com, and it yep. was taken by someone else. And then I, of course, realized that butch.org is the, is better anyway. And I have a little banner that says, uh, you know, it's the virtual safe space for butches everywhere. Nice. Um, nice. But it's also now my personal website. So I did see, um, I, oh, th thank you, Emery. I see Emery showing, uh, th throwing up some other things here in the chat. Uh, line here. And just to remind everybody, I'm Hunter Rohanian. I'm the director of the Stonewall National Museum and Archives here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And my guest tonight um, is Jenny Olson. Hello, J Jenny. Say hello to everybody again. Um, and so we'll take questions at, at the end, the last 15 minutes, but please feel free to throw your comments um, in either the chat or the Q&A part here, because we certainly are looking at those as we get, go along. Um, I, and just speaking of butch.org, I noticed, I, I may be, be behind the time, sir, but um, there has, they have released a, a whole series of, of domains, um, new d domains, .gay and uh, online.gay, and so there are a variety of, of uh, other opportunities. I don't know if butch is gone, um, but it's an opportunity to look at there, so. Uh. I figure, you know, I have the best thing, so. <laughs> right, there's no change, there's no change. Um, so let's talk about, so how much stuff, how much stuff was given to Harvard in the archives? Uh, I don't know what the, uh, you know, linear feet are, um, <laughs> but uh, big, huge pallets full of, things. And I don't know if you like physically, I should have brought some of them up. Uh, but you know, 35 millimeter film cans are big, whatever, they weigh a lot. Um, uh, hundreds of trailers is the is the thing that there's the most of and um, uh, anyway, I can't I don't even I should I should quantify it more. But uh, uh, and then, uh, you know, as I was saying, lots of um, promotional materials. Um, when I, I did this book in 2005, uh, the queer movie poster book, and probably 75% of it was from my own collection. Uh, and some of those, actually some of that material was donated, I donated to the uh, GLBT Historical Society here in San Francisco. Um, and some of it I hung on to, and so that stuff will be going to Harvard. Um, and then um, my, these other, you know, kind of my uh, uh, movie stills collections, and which like, I don't know, oh, here's um, Norman Is That You, 1976, yep. really stupid gay movie. Um, the classic, The Killing of Sister George. Sure. Um, stuff like that. Um, and it's interesting you said the thing about uh, being a collector. I, for the longest time, I just thought of myself as a collector. And in the archival historian world, collectors tend to be kind of looked down upon. And I think, you know, tend to not have the most rigorous uh, you know, parameters around things in the same way that archivists do. And, uh, but, but if it weren't for collectors, there would be so many things that would be lost. Um, sure. You know, that, uh, anyway, so there was a point where I finally decided to stop calling myself a collector and call myself an archivist, um, just to be, feel like I would be taken more seriously. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I think I'm, yeah, I'm kind of both. Um, but yeah. Well, but of course, I think I think one does have to be a collector before one becomes an archivist, in the sense that the stuff has got to come in somewhere. And then, what an archivist does, it an archivist catalogs it and analyzes it and understands its importance and helps interpret it 
for um, either present or f future c cultures. And, um, and sometimes that happens simultaneously while you're c collecting, but also sometimes some of us collect things simply to collect them and we'll figure out, because we know it's important, and we'll figure out its use at some later point. I mean, it's, it seems to me that you're kind of young to have your, your archives go to Harvard at this point. Are you, are you, are you done co collecting? Am I done collecting? Yeah. Uh, well, I'm, I think I'm mostly done uh, accumulating LGBT film stuff, although I confess I, I have recently developed a, a new addiction to um, vintage uh, wire service photos, which are like from like the 30s and 40s. I sort of, I don't know, stumbled on the particularly and I actually, I'll just give a shout out right now to the Butch Hair Quarantine Instagram account, Butch Hair Quarantine. I'm guest curating it this week and I'm sharing photos from this collection, which are um, these wire service photos. So like the, the news in the 30s and 40s, there are all these examples of folks who were passing as men and were arrested and determined to be uh, folks who were, um, uh, you know, assigned female at birth. Um, and uh, there are these amazing people. They're so amazing. Um, and, you know, so these, you know, guys in suits and um, who, who passed in the 30s and 40, 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s even. And um, anyway, so that, that's my latest addiction. Um, and it's pretty amazing stuff. <laughs> well, we can always talk about a place for that to go at some point in the future, but I know you're just starting that. So, <laughs> um, but let's, let's talk about the archives at, at Harvard. So the question has been posed here, will they be uh, digitizing the work that you, they have sent uh, or that you, you sent it to them that they've amassed of yours? And then also, what are their exhibition plans? Um, so the main exhibition plans are uh, showing things physically at the, their cinema in Boston when the world opens up again, um, oh. like showing the actual film prints. And the, there's not really a plan to digitize. Well, there's not a plan to make them publicly available, um, which is interesting. Of course, that's usually people's first question because it's so exciting and, and everyone wants to see things. Um, but because of rights issues, it mainly has not been possible. Um, there are some things, uh, so like there's a film, 1967 short documentary called Queens at Heart, which is interviews with four trans women in New York City, two years before Stonewall. Um, that I unearthed years ago um, that we worked with the uh, Outfest UCLA Legacy Project to do a restoration of that. And that is available online also at butch.org. <laughs> um, it's available through, um, through Vimeo and through uh, Canopy as well. Um, and so there are some examples of things where I've tried to uh, make them available online, and but a lot of things that are uh, uh, not, uh, I don't have, you know, copyright clearances, um, which is one of the greatest challenges in, in doing archival work. Yes, because of course, we, we do need to protect our fellow artists copyright and, and their, their property ownership rights and that, but by the same time, at, by, by the same token, we're interested in sharing that, that work as well, too. And so that does certainly become um, a challenge. Um, a question was asked about posting a link. And just for those of you who might be uh, listening to this afterwards, either on Facebook or, or um, on Instagram, uh, the Harvard film, the co collection that we're talking about is called harvardfilmarchive.org slash collections. And then also, 
Uh, there was uh, something which Jenny just mentioned on Instagram, and um, that is the Butch Hair Quarantine, and that Instagram page is Instagram.com, obviously, um, slash uh, Butch Hair Quarantine. And so even if you don't remember those exact names, I'm sure if you Google them, you'll be able to find those quite quite easily as well too. And also I'm more than happy, um, Emery, if we can just make a note that we can post some of these resources out there so that some of the things that we're capturing now and the comments that if people want to be able to get them afterwards, they would have access to them as well. So. Um, we have a question here. What, what advice would you give queer history projects outside, or those who put queer history projects together outside of major metropolitan areas who are working to collect and preserve local home movies? Um, the, this particular person writes, and my challenge after doing this work for the last decade or so is that most people don't think their home videos are important. Um, but living in a city with the world's largest naval base, we must have some cool stuff stashed in our closets. Uh, before you answer, I just want to give my two cents that number one, that stuff is very important. And number two, there are troves of really important queer history outside of the metropolitan areas that have not been mined. And in many ways, they're less influenced by fashion of the day. And I don't mean clothing per se, I just mean aesthetic fashion of the, the day. Some of them can be incredibly interesting. If there's any way of getting people to turn them over as opposed to just ending up in a dumpster, it, it do whatever you can to, to let them understand that those things are very, very important. Jenny? Um. I mean, uh, that's a really wonderful question. And I think, um, you know, obviously there are, are institutions like the Stonewall Museum and the GLBT Historical Society here in San Francisco. And, and then uh, there's like the Treader Collection in Minneapolis and um, the different regional uh, LGBT archives and historical societies um, who, you know, could be good resources to work with. Um, a couple things about home movies. There is a there's a thing called Home Movie Day, um, where folks regionally organize a, around these things, and there's some best practices there ab about like how to get the word out. Um, whether it's it can be partnering with your uh, local public library to reach people, um, partnering with actual um, scanning facilities. Like uh, there's a, a company here called Movet that partners with for the home of, they actually run the home movie day. Um, and cause obviously that's the big piece of it is getting the scans done. Um, but I think I would say the most significant thing in so many ways about this kind of work is it is so driven by individual people who are like, I think this is important I mean, so you think this is important, you're putting your time and energy into it and finding ways to find people and, and convince them to trust you. <laughs> and, and um, you know, it's difficult. I mean, and it's a, it's a very difficult thing um, to get financial support for, um, but uh, I think partnering with other existing organizations, you know, is one, one possibility, but it does end up being, it's like, you know, individual people who care are, is what drives this kind of work forward. Um, so, you know, thank you. You know, it sounds like you've already been doing a lot of work and, um, you know, carry on. <laughs> yeah, no, that's very well said. And it's really, you know, and Congratulations to doing that, that work. It is a challenge, but just remember the challenge is really no different in the suburbs than it is in the urban center as well too, and that you have to fight for that work. And no matter where you are located in the country, you will find um, a queer archive relatively close to you. Um, as Jenny said, there's a great one in San Francisco that we've worked in. We happen to be in South Florida. And if you go to the stonewall-museum.org and you go to other resources, we have intentionally put up a list of probably 20 or 30 other queer archives around the United States, simply to let people know that there's a place for them to 
to explore, to give their archives to, or to talk to about best pr practices. And some of them may not be the right place for film to go to. Film has its own special requirements, as does art, as do books, as do manuscripts. And so you need to have a conversation, but, but it's important to realize that there are many places out there that are available to, to you. And it does require some work. Um, and if you have any questions and want to email any of us at Stonewall, we'll, we'll try to help you. And I'm sure Jenny would be willing to help you sort of figure out what you have, not go through it piece by piece, but try to sort of understand what you have and what you're looking for and try to find a good home for it. Because those of us who are in this business, what we care about the most is not so much owning something as much as it is about making sure that, that it's being preserved. This is about preserving culture. And it's those of us that care about this part of the culture that we just want to make, make sure it's saved. Um, so let's go on to a few of these um, other questions here. So um, good to have that the presentation supported the institution, even when the community access shifts, seems like a trade-off. Yes, that's true. And I think that that question always has to be balanced between the trade-off between institutional support and um, uh, support by the community. I would say my two cents for what it's worth is there is a whole bunch of stuff coming out of the last quarter of the 20th century uh, or even the last half of the 20th century that we're seeing this sort of abodanza. It's, it's, this, it's this trove of stuff which people are finding and it's not going to last for forever. Things are going to be found and, and then it's going to go, go dry after after a while. But if you take the idea that a lot of stuff is being unearthed, and also from the academic and cultural community, there is tremendous interest in preserving this part of American culture and artistic culture. And where 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, people were shy about saying, oh, it's creepier. Oh, people don't want this. No, that's not true. Academic, academics, um, uh, uh, historians and archivists are very interested because they understand the role and they don't even have to be gay to understand it. If they have bias and prejudice, so be it. But the majority of them are actually interested in preserving this part of, of our collective culture. And so if you run into a dead end with somebody, you will find five people with opening doors. So really um, reach out because you're, you're going to find them. Um, another question here is, uh, what can queer women do to make sure our history is documented? Do you want to try that one? Um, well, that's a great question and um, uh, a unique challenge. I mean, I think um, historically we've seen uh, much more access to uh, gay men's materials. Um, there are there are several dedicated lesbian um, archives and um, uh, focuses uh, in, in other collections. And I saw some, uh, I think Esther uh, put a post up about the Lesbian Home Movie Project um, th that Sharon Thompson does, um, which is an interesting example because it underscores what I was just saying that like so much of this work is driven by individual people and who feel passionate and um, similarly um, the Bay Area lesbian archives here in San Francisco, here in the Bay Area is also you know very much driven by individuals um, and um, oh what is the answer to that Franco um, uh, I mean you know, I guess working with existing archives. Um, and I, I mean, I would say, uh, this is kind of underscoring what you were just saying, um, was that uh, people sometimes think like, oh, you know, this stuff that I have is like, it's not very important. It's just like, you know, like whatever, here's like a ticket stub and a, you know, these little things, like whatever, I'm just gonna recycle it. It's, you know, not important. And actually, for historians and archivists, like this is like really important. <laughs> like this, the, these kind of ephemeral things that, you know, it's this kind of uh, 
I, I mean, I had that approach to my, my film collecting initially was I collected things where I thought these are things that people mainly think are not important. They're just ephemeral. Um, like my uh, 16 millimeter Charles Nelson Riley Jello commercial now with real fruit. <laughs> <laughs> um, and like, I was like, that is really important because in a gay context, you know, when he was closeted in the seventies and he's talking about real fruit, like this is incredible. Um, and uh, anyway, but, um, but so I think it's important for people to recognize that, you know, even their most ephemeral things are important and, and I guess working with existing institutions. Yeah, and, and again, it's for, for me, it's always about preserving it and trying to make sure it doesn't get thrown away. So whether you see it at a, at a yard sale or a garage sale, or you know someone who's cleaning out somebody's house or, or you're speaking to somebody and they say, I don't know what to do with it, just help them find a place, help, it, help secure this work because truly when it's destroyed, it's destroyed. And if the only existing copy of Charles Nelson Riley or Paul Lind, um, promoting this stuff, if it, if it doesn't exist, it is a pe or, or Brett Summers, it's a piece of our, it's a piece of our history that's gone away. And there are people who really want it. Well, Jenny, as, as I said earlier, our time is, 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 was going to go by very fast and we've come to the end of our hour. Uh, and I didn't even get to ask you what you've been watching on your screen for the last five months of the pandemic, but we're gonna have to wait to, for next time to, to that. Uh, before we wrap up, any any last observations or uh, words of advice you want to give? Um, well, I was just answering, uh, someone was asking for recommendations on queer documentaries, and I just said Paris is Burning and Tongues Untied are the two things I would recommend. Actually, I'll add um, Strong Island, which is on Netflix, and um, Disclosure, Trans Lives on Screen, which is also on Netflix. Um, and... Um, support your local uh, LGBT archives and historical societies because they're doing the work that's saving our history. Yeah, no, that's very well said. Um, and I, I really appreciate it. Um, I never heard of Home Movie Day. I think it's a great idea. And I really want to, uh, I really want to uh, pursue that. Um, there have been lots of great questions here. Um, Emery, can I ask that you can keep um, this open? Maybe we shut the cameras down once we sign off and, and we can answer some of these, uh, some of these questions. Um, and um, so we'll tr try to get to as many of them as we can. Uh, just as a reminder, um, tell your friends that they can see this. This will be posted on the Stonewall website and it, it's also being simulcast right now on Facebook. And so I'll post it again and I'm sure Jenny will post it and Stonewall will re repost this. So encourage people to see it and just to encourage people to continue to save uh, the work that they have. Um, to stay up to date with all the things that we're doing here at Stonewall, we just opened an exhibition last week called Elected Sisters, uh, pioneering uh, by lesbian and trans women who were the first women to be elected in various places throughout the United States. Um, so that's available for you to see if you're here in South Florida. I believe that the virtual version of that exhibition will be up later this week, and, but I know you can actually see a talk about uh, that exhibition now on our website and also on Facebook as well. So um, please feel free to stop in um, e either online or in person to see that. Be sure to sign up uh, to get all of our announcements for Stonewall. Next week, our, our guest will be Liz Collins, uh, who is a wonderful, yes, yeah, she's great, right? Uh, uh, she does amazing work and uh, so she has a new book out, and so we'll be looking. She, it's a wonderful uh, compilation of a lot of different artists, and so we'll be looking at that uh, next week. So please be, for, be sure to see that. Um, and finally, just send us any comments. Uh, we're now at a point where we're getting lots of comments and interest in the series, and so we want it to reflect those of you who are enjoying us having these talks and these conversations. So don't be shy about offering your suggestions um, to, to make it happen. 
So Jenny, it was wonderful to, to meet you. I hope you and I get to meet each other in person and work on a project together again at some point. And good luck um, to your two uh, kids as they go through their uh, last year of high school and uh, last, year of last year of high school, last year of college. Yep, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for having me, really an honor to, to be here.